Good morning, Surprise Christian Church. How's it going? Good. My name is Brian Starr. I am one of the pastors here. And uh, Drew has been super awesome and allowed me to uh, come and have a conversation with my family. As you guys, many of you may have noticed, if you've been around for a while, I have not been around. I've been around for a long time, but you haven't seen me up here or even here um, since about the beginning of August, which makes it really weird because I was also on vacation for like three weeks and the beginning of July. So I feel like I haven't been around at all. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about what's going on and why I haven't been here. And here's why. This has nothing to do, well, it has a lot to do with me, but it actually has a lot to do with how much I love God and how much I love the place of Surprise Christian Church. Um, one of our values here is to be real. And if you're new here, I hope what you'll see every week is when you meet us when we're not here, we're the same exact people. Or when we're not on this stage, when we're out here talking to you, we're the same exact people as, um, as, as when we're on here. That we are real with what's going on in our lives. We're real with who we are, what we struggle with, all of those things. Um, and that's what I'm going to do for you today. And there's another part of it in our values that says that stories matter. And when we don't share our stories with other people, other people, one, don't get to learn but two, sometimes people can feel alone because they go, I'm the only one who has that happen to us. Man, am I really following God? Am I this or that? And so I'm going to spend a little time sharing my story with you. Uh, at the end of 2022, I realized that something was wrong. Um, I wasn't feeling very well. I was going home Coming home from school, and if you don't know me, I've been a school counselor for 17 years, and then I've been on staff here at Surprise Christian Church for the last 10 years. So I have two jobs that anytime they bring out research, it talks about the least paying, most stressful jobs. Those are the ones that God built me for. Awesome. So I've been doing this for a long time, and what I realized was for a long time as a school counselor, I could hear all the stuff that was going on at school and I could leave it at my desk and I could walk, walk home and I was fine. I could leave things at the foot of the cross and give every story that the kids told me, every instance that I went through, it was all right for many, many years. I wish to tell you that being a school counselor was just writing letters of recommendations and, and getting kids' classes right, but that's not it. I did that, but the majority of my time was spent on CPS calls, kids that were contemplating suicide, um, all sorts of crazy stories. Um, there was those fun times where I got to write letters of recommendations, but then there was lots of not fun times. And then when you add that to... Being someone who God built to build relationships with people and coming here and being a pastor and, and helping shepherd people, I got involved in a lot of the struggles of everyone's lives. And it was my joy and it was my privilege. But as I said, as I would try to leave it at work pray that God take this, this is yours, I can't control it, I felt it trailing me. So I have lots of great friends, I have lots of wise mentors, and they all said, hey, you need to go to counseling. I'm not against that, I love it, I'm all about it, I think everyone should have a counselor, it's huge and very, very important, because life is hard. And so last year I went and did a lot of counseling and the term compassion fatigue was thrown out. And what it means is when you deal with everybody else's stuff, you just end up wearing yourself out because of the compassion you share and you walk with. 
And so that is what was going on. So I went to weekly counseling sessions and I pulled back from some things here um, to give myself more time. And then as I prayed and prayed and prayed, one of my lifelong goals before I ever thought I was going to be a counselor is I just wanted to be a high school history teacher. And, and God gave me the opportunity to stay at the same school that I'm at, but move into teaching history, which is way less stressful than being a counselor. So I was able to make a job change, which started in August. And so I was feeling really good. I knew there was an end in sight to the counseling. And um, I was doing my own counseling. And after a few months, my counselor, who I love and was and so thankful for, said, Brian, you're done. Like, we got you. Like, and I, and I felt pretty good. But one thing I need to tell you is that I have been spending this whole year kind of looking at Romans 8.28, you know, and it just says all things are, are rather good for those who love the Lord, right? And so I realized that as I now look back, I was feeling pretty good. I was not good. And that verse doesn't say pretty good. It says good. And I knew there were a couple things that I probably needed to talk about, but they're the really hard things, right? They're not just the kind of hard things. They're the really hard things. And when, when a professional says, hey, you're good, that's my out. Sounds good. I changed my job. I went on a three-week vacation with my family. Everything was good. That all changed August 8th. August 8th was the day before my first day of school. I was working in my classroom. I was super excited to, to get ready and to have my kids for the first time in 17 years in my classroom. And <clears throat> my wife and oldest daughter in San Diego on vacation. I was a little jealous, but I was so excited about school. I would rather be sweating it out. And so I was at school and I get a phone call from my youngest daughter and she says, Dad, Gammy, who's my mother-in-law, their grandma, didn't show up to her volunteer job. And she's not answering the phone and she's not answering the door. I knew that I had seen Sue, my mother-in-law, on Sunday night because we go out to German food because, well, we're the only ones who'll eat it. And so everybody else was out of town. So it was like, hey, let's go. So we had had a good dinner on Sunday night, but it is now Tuesday afternoon, and I had not talked to her. And instantly in my brain, I'm like, uh-oh, this is bad. I told her really fast. She's like, I got a key. I'll just go over and check on her. And I said, no, you are not checking on her. I will be home as soon as possible. So I run to my car. A huge blessing that I have in my life is one of my best friends who also goes to church here, Chris Quant works with me at Ironwood, and I call him, I'm like, I did the right thing, I didn't have Grace come, and he's like, yeah, and he goes, just swing around to the parking lot, I'm jumping in, and he jumps into the car with me, and we drive to my house. My mother-in-law lives pretty much across the street from me. We get to her house, and I thought for sure I was going to find my mother-in-law dead on the floor. I walked in, and praise God, she was alive. She had fallen, she had gotten her feet wrapped up in her sheets on Sunday night as she was changing her sheets and she had fell and broken her hip and was stuck on the floor. I will tell you that that moment, everything changed. Uh, something inside of me broke. My mother-in-law, who I love and is one of my great friends, I couldn't be in the room with her. Um, Thank God Chris was there. My, her neighbor had actually broken into the house and was sitting with her. And I used the excuse to go call 911. And so I called 911, but I could not walk back in that room. I tried and I couldn't. It was like something had just finally snapped inside of me. Called 911, I let my wife know what was going on, and I was going to be the good, the good son-in-law, the great husband, right? Backstory to this, my father-in-law died on the day that my wife and I were in Disneyland uh, celebrating our anniversary, and my wife is in California wanting to, trying to get home as quick as possible to be with her mom, and I'm like, I'm not doing this again. I didn't make it. I didn't get my wife home in time to see her dad before her dad died, like, I will be with my mother-in-law. 
Well, the thing that sucks is that we went into the emergency room, and I've been a pastor for a long time. Ten years is a long time. And I've been in that emergency room in some pretty awful situations. And so the stress and the anxiety that I was feeling inside her house multiplied as I walked into this emergency room. And the smells and everything of this room just absolutely triggered every fear and everything that I had going on in my body. But I was going to stay there, and I tried to stay there, and I tried to stay there. And, and Chris and my daughter were out in the, the lobby, and I kept checking in on them and walking out because I just could barely survive. Thank God my wife got home pretty quick because she doesn't understand speed limits. And... Uh, um. She was, she was there just after we got her out of the emergency room and into her own room. And it only got crazier because then my mother-in-law's heart started to fail. And I'm so glad she was there with me because I don't think I would have been able to handle it. Um, but we, in, by the end of that night, we got her settled into ICU and she was stable. So it was time to go home. It was about 10 o'clock at night, first day of school the next morning. And I felt awful. And I just was like, it's my anxiety. It's my anxiety. It's no big deal. I've dealt with anxiety. I know what it's like. But I knew one thing is that if I take my blood pressure, it only feels like my blood pressure is high because of my anxiety. It's not actually high. Well, I took it that night, and it was 187 over 117. Actually, I have a cyst in my eye right now, which I get to get taken out on Tuesday, but it was so big at that point because my blood pressure was so high, it almost completely covered my eye. And I walked downstairs and I said, Andrea, I don't mean to make this about me, but we need to go back to the emergency room. So my wife and I get in the car and we drive back to the emergency room and I get home at like three o'clock in the morning after they got my, my blood pressure down. And I was at least smart. Okay, I wasn't smart enough. All my friends and my principal convinced me not to go to work on the first day of school. I was dressed and ready to go. I felt awful, but I was going to go. If I was told not to go, I didn't go. And I just stayed at home. On that Thursday, two days later, I went to school and it was a great day. I had so much fun being with kids. And I was like, okay, God, you've got me in the right spot. This is amazing. My mother-in-law was doing better. They were prepping her for surgery the next day. And at 2 o'clock in the morning that night, I was asleep, and I woke up barely able to breathe, massive chest pains, pain down my arm, pain in my jaw, and I'm like, sweet, I'm having a heart attack. Fantastic. So we call 911. And I get transported back to the emergency room. I do an EKG, and my EKG is abnormal. Um, I miss, like, the next week of school and one of the reasons why I haven't been here. As of last Monday, I've gone through a ton of tests, and praise God, my heart is strong. Everything is good. I have absolutely no physical things except for I'm a fat 47-year-old with you know, a little bit of high blood pressure, but I'm on meds and it's good. But here's the problem. Ever since that day, at least two times a day, my body completely breaks down. I feel like I'm having a heart attack. I can't breathe. I, it can be from moments where I was at some boroughs on Thursday, and these two ladies started arguing about how they treated each other at a funeral, and I'm just trying to eat a burrito. And all of a sudden, I was like, I've been in this situation. I've tried to mediate conversations like this, and it was just like, Bleh! life just like blows up. But then there's other times where I'm like driving home from fries, and absolutely nothing is wrong, and all of a sudden, everything is wrong. And so, again, talking to wise mentors and everything, I was, I was told that here's the deal. When you found your mother-in-law on the ground, all of the trauma that you have 
had in your own life or been a part of by helping people, which is, there's a term called secondary trauma, has all just measure, just added up and now I have no physical things wrong with me, but mentally it is causing physical symptoms. So Tuesday I started trauma counseling. You know it's going to be fun when, the, when they give you the homework of write down the 10 worst things that have ever happened in your life so you can talk about them. And then they say, well, well you can write down the good things too, but we probably won't talk about those a whole lot. It's just easier to write. And I was like, good times. So I'm going to start going through those. There's a whole bunch of things that are going to go on. And why I'm telling you all of this is that I know as I start walking through this, I need to take a break from being a pastor here at Surprise Christian Church. Not because I've lost faith. In fact, my faith is stronger than it ever has been. It was funny, when I started, started the counseling thing, he starts asking me about my jobs, and, and he goes, you're overworked, dude. And I looked at him and I went, I hope I'm not paying you $125 for that because, well, that's pretty easy. And so he was like, you should quit one of your jobs. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just start talking. And then he gets closer to the end of our hour together and he goes, you, you, uh, you couldn't quit, huh? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he goes, well, if I told you to stop being a teacher, you'd hate it. And I said, yeah, I absolutely would. And he said, and if I told you to stop being a pastor, you'd hate it. And I said, yeah, I absolutely would. I said, I've been praying for 10 years for God to say, you're going to be a pastor or you're going to be a teacher because both is really, really hard. And he goes, okay. And I said, but I know I need to take a break from pastoring because, well, I can. I can't take a break from teaching because... Well, I like my house. Um, so, so I am. I went to Drew, and if you guys ever need to be thankful of an amazing pastor and amazing leadership, it is the people of Surprise Christian Church. I went to Drew and I said, Drew, I'm going to take a two-month sabbatical. Two months. And he looks at me and he goes, why two months? And I was like, hope. And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, if I go to counseling, I'll feel better. It's like Christmas time. Well, everything will be awesome. And then he goes, it's not because you're afraid I'm going to replace you. Oh. You know, when someone says out loud the thoughts that you'd never be willing to say out loud yourself. I was like, yeah, I'm saying two months because I am. I, I, I love it here. And he said, Brian, I'm never replacing you. You need to do what you need to do and be healthy and then come back. So today I'm telling you that I'm going to step away from being pastor at Surprise Christian Church for a time. I don't know how long that time is. I pray that it's quick because this stuff is hard. But I have so much faith in God that he will walk through this with me and he will bring it to be completely good to be completely good so here's a couple things that I ask my family and I have talked and we've prayed about it a ton and we need to be here I don't want to go anywhere else I don't want to find new people you guys are my family right so I'm going to be here I'm still Brian. I'm just not going to be Pastor Brian for a little while. Pastoring is still in me, right? Like taking care of you is still in me. So there's what I'm going to ask. Let's just talk. And if I can't have the conversation, I'll tell you. And don't be offended. If, I email, if you email me and check on me, you totally can. If I don't write back, it's because, well, life is kind of crazy. So we're going to be around. There's going to be weeks that I'm going to be at both services because people charge me up and I love people and I like being with people and 
being here is a lot easier than the rest of my life right now. But there's always going to be weeks that I'm only going to be here once, and there's going to be weeks that I'm not here. And just allow that to be okay, because I'm going to be just like you guys. And that's kind of how you guys work, too. And I ask you to pray for my wife and my daughters. Being a pastor's wife and being pastor's kids is never easy. And then when it all changes, it's even harder. There's been a time in my daughter's lives where they lost all of their friends because of stuff that they weren't involved in, but it was because I was following God, and it's really hard. And so there's a huge fear on their end that that, that is going to happen if I step away. The other part is, is that pray for my wife because we have an amazing privilege to allow my mother-in-law to live with us because she needs a lot of care. And so she's with us now at our house. We've changed a whole bunch of stuff up. I'm super thankful for people of the church who literally, when I could do nothing, came and tore apart my house and moved things upstairs and downstairs and into the garage and everything so we could bring her home. <clears throat> There's another part of this that I need you to hear. I've shared this story with a couple of people, and the response that I get is, dang it, I shared really hard stuff with you, and I'm sorry. Can I tell you? There is only one enemy, and it's Satan. There is not any one of you who has ever shared a story with me or allowed me the privilege to walk through hard stuff in your life and speak of what God does and who God is and how he's working that, that has ever been anything hard. It has been a privilege and I have absolutely loved it. And the only reason why this is not going well for me right now is Satan and not anyone else. I had that conversation with my mother-in-law because she had nothing to do with it. Satan is the one. God built us a perfect home. We sinned, and Satan has been messing with it ever since. And so he is the only enemy, none of you. None of you. Two more things as I finish up, and I'm going to give Drew lots of time to preach today, is simply this. If it's not good, keep giving it to God. If there is anything in your life that you've gone, man, I, I'm afraid that's really hard. I can't do that. I love, I love Matthew 9. Matthew 9 is this, this story of all Jesus walking through all of the sadness and hurt from sin in the world. And it gets to verse 35, and it just says, Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. There's so much hard stuff in the world and hard stuff in our lives. Give it to God. Every bit of it. Do not be afraid to give it to God and allow him to shepherd you through all of it. If it is not good, he is not done with it yet. Allow him to keep working. Even if it's pretty good, keep working through that. And then the last thing I'm going to ask you, you're going to think it's for one reason, and I'm going to tell you it's for another. Please serve. Please serve at Surprise Christian Church. And it is not because there is going to be some huge void because Brian was this amazing server. It's because of this. When I went to the hospital, when I was actually on my way, I got to find my mother-in-law. I called Chris. And Chris jumped in my car. When I was going to the hospital the night before the first day of school, it was like 11.30 at night. It was super late. And I called Chris. And within 15 minutes, his wife, who's also a teacher, was at our house with everything she needed to get ready to bring, uh, to spend the night with my daughters so they wouldn't be alone when in the emergency room. And the reason why I know Chris is because 17 years ago, I made the choice to serve at a church. 
The church did not create any amazing program or anything for me to meet people. I was just loving kids and serving in children's ministry, and Chris and I got to go to camp together. And then we've shared lots of meals, shot lots of really open, hard conversations. We've had ice cream. We've hung out at baseball games. We've just hung out at each other's houses and done absolutely nothing. And I now have a friend that I know that I can call on to do anything. He's picked up my groceries. He has texts my daughters, takes them out to dinner without us just because he loves us. And I know that you guys go, oh, I want relationship. I need relationship. Church, what are you doing? What are you doing? Build the relationships without us because it will go far further than anything that we can do. But serve because you're going to spend time with amazing people that make up this church and you're going to meet amazing people that walk in the door and they're going to change your life because God will work through all things. Allow him to shepherd you. This is not an end. This is a beginning. I know that I'm going to walk through some really hard stuff but I can't wait. Drew, I'm going to mess you up. We're going to read a psalm. Want to stand with me? This is the first time I've ever writ- had a, given a sermon without writing anything. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to read Psalm 23. It's been my hope. It's been something I've read at least three times a day. For the last two months almost. Something that you guys all know. Hopefully, if not, let me introduce you. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. My favorite part. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. You may be seated. I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to have Drew come up. Heavenly Father God Lord I thank you that we don't have to be perfect to come to you that we get to come to you in all of our brokenness and we get to fall apart into your hands Lord you are our creator And so when we fall apart into your hands, you know exactly how to put us back together. And Lord, we come to you just as that today. Not knowing where all the pieces fit. Being hurt by sin and shame. Choices of our own and choices of others. And other times it's just backwash of living in a broken, fallen world. So Lord, I ask you to help us to give our whole lives to you, holding nothing back, but giving it everything to you. Lord, when Satan walks into the scene, protect us, as he is always prowling. Allow any of his schemes to fall short, any arrow he may shoot, that it is not fruitful, it does not hit us, but we are protected by you. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing at this church, this body of believers, that as we go out, we serve you with enthusiasm, with love, that it's not anything that is contained in this building, but it's something that goes out and influences surprise in every life that we touch because you have brought us to life. You have given us everything. Lord, help us to remember that we never have to do anything amazing because you have done all the work. You sent your son to die on the cross 
and we are free to live for you. Help us to live a life that is joyful because the joy comes from you. No matter what we face, remember that you are guiding us. Sometimes you make us lie beside, beside still waters because we don't want to rest, thinking we have something to give to you, but you've given us everything. Allow every one of our actions to be a response by the love and the salvation you've given to us through your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Love you. Understand, I only offer free hugs to certain people. All right? <laughs> I'm not a hugger, but I'm going to hug Brian. I just want to make sure I say that out loud. <laughs> I love you, dude. Love you, um, can I pray again? I'm not going to let him leave. I'm going to pray over him real quick. Can we do that together? <laughs> Lord Jesus, just I want to thank you for Brian, Lord. I want to thank you for Andrea and Kayla and Grace and Josh and Maddie. And Lord, what an amazing family. What an amazing blessing um, that they have been to us. I just ask, Lord, that you let us be a blessing to them. Uh, God, they, Brian has carried so many burdens. Let us help carry some of his um, but, Lord, ultimately we know that your burden is light, right? Your yoke is easy, Lord. You invite us to bring our burdens to you. Um, so, God, just as he goes through this process, I, I want to say how grateful I am for his honesty, Lord, that he is real, um, that he is, is true to you in everything, Lord, and um, never pretends to be someone he isn't. Lord, what an amazing blessing he's been to me as a mentor, as a friend. Um, Lord, I just, I just want to praise you. I want to praise you for him. Uh, and thank you as you walk with him every step of this journey. Uh, Lord, you're an awesome God. Praise all in the name of Jesus. Amen. I do have to tell you one thing, because my wife would kill me if I didn't. She goes, you have to remember to tell people that there are blessings in the middle of it, because beginning of August, I don't even know the date anymore. It was sometime, whatever. I became a grandpa. My son and my daughter-in-law had a, a healthy little boy. His name is Gray Anthony McKinnis, and we, we uh, happened to, it was fun, Kayla and I were going to go to a Brandon Lake concert in San Diego, and it happened to just happen right at the time where Kayla and I were already going to be there, and, and my wife got to drive over to San Diego, and we all got to be together and see, and see Gray just after he was born, and, uh, and that has been such a huge blessing and amazing thing, and they're actually coming this weekend to, to be with us and to see Sue because um, Josh wants to see his grandma. And so I'm supposed to tell you that in the midst of everything that seems to be going wrong, God is still providing blessings. And so Amen. I had to tell you that. I love you guys. As I'm sure you can guess and put together, we will not be talking about James this morning. Okay. <laughs> However, however, I do have something I do want to share with you. Come with me to Matthew, if you will. And we're going to go to chapter 23, okay? Matthew chapter 23. And at first, this is going to seem like a strange passage, but it's going to add up here in just a second. Um, I just want to encourage you guys. As, as Brian laid out so much of what's going on in his life and, and is you know, really exemplifying our value here of being real and just speaking honestly, I understand that when people do that and they have those conversations, that the people that are listening and all the things that you guys brought in, all the burdens, all the hurts, all the traumas, all the trials that you guys brought in here, all of that comes from down here, right, and wells up to the surface. And now all those feelings, all those emotions are on your mind too. Um, and so I, I wanted to take a minute to, to help us understand a little bit more about what do we do now with that, right? How do we, how do we move forward with that? So we're in this passage in Matthew 23. Uh, check this out. This is a pretty serious passage. Jesus is, is rebuking the, the Pharisees. In the midst of that, he says this, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the crowd and said to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. They do everything to be seen by others. They enlarge their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love the place of honor at banquets 
in the front seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called rabbi, or you just sub in pastor, okay? <laughs> be pastor by people. But you're not to be called rabbi because you have one teacher, and you are all brothers and sisters. Do not call anyone on earth your father because you have one father who is in heaven. You are not to be called instruct- instructors either because you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. What you just saw and you heard is a perfect example of a man who is willing to humble himself before God, be honest and open, and not put on you a burden that he can't carry himself. And I hope you heard that, right? Because as pastors, as leaders, as teachers, as people in the church, we can have a tendency to, to strap on burdens and, and uh, a false way of living that we don't even live up to ourselves. And so if you go to the end of this passage, Jesus is going to list out all of these woes to these false teachers, these leaders, these Pharisees, okay? But at the very end, you get this amazing passage here in verse 37. It says this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So right after this, Jesus is about to go to the cross and he gives this final cry after giving all these serious woes to these religious leaders. He ends it with this heartfelt honesty. How often I tried to gather you Right, like a hen gathers her chicks. In other words, right, <laughs> like a mom with her babies. I tried. I tried to care for you. I tried to take care of you. Right. I tried to provide for you, but you were unwilling. And I wanted to go back to that communion thought I shared with you guys this morning and just say this. What God is inviting each of us to do is to come to him fully, honestly, and authentically, with all the hurts, with all the pains, with all the traumas, with all the complaints that we have against him, with all the anger, and to truly lay that at his feet and let him meet us there. The religious leaders, what they did is they, they filled in the gap with religion. Okay, You want to write your relationship with God. Well, here's a list of laws I can put on your shoulders. All right, and here's the things that we do to obey those laws so they could look like they had it all together, right? And, and then go around and say, hey, pastor, hey, pastor, hey, pastor, right? And be praised as a celebrity or someone famous or whatever. But the invitation of Jesus is to bring all of our guilt, all of our sin, all of our anger, all of our hurts, and put it on his shoulders and let him meet us there. Um, Brian has done an amazing job of exemplifying that today. And so here's what I would like to encourage you to do, all right? Um, Brad is here in the back there. I'm here up front. I'm just going to stick around. If you'd like to if you come pray with me, I invite you to do that. Um, sometimes it just helps to have someone there with you as you share with the Lord. But in the midst of all that heaviness, I didn't want to leave you without an opportunity to just say, man, maybe there's something that I need to come to the Lord with. And so Brad and I are here um, we, we will more than, be more than willing to pray with you. We would love to pray with you and help give that to the Lord. But let me leave you with this, all right? None of us can fool God, all right? We can try to fool each other that everything's right and everything's perfect and everything's good, but none of us can fool God. When you go before God and you have anger with him, or a problem, right? If we pretend, and we just say, well, as long as I say my prayers the right way, God's going to hear me. Do you think God doesn't know? <laughs> Do you think he doesn't look at your heart and say, I see how angry you actually are with me, and you're not saying it, right? I see, I see that what you're holding on to your heart right there, but you're not confessing to me. Of course, but we, we pretend, right? We like to think that God doesn't know our very souls, <laughs> know our words before we say them, Right? I want to invite you to that, to not pretend with God, to be clear and honest and open and let him meet you there. All right? I love you guys. We're here for you. Let me pray for you and let you go. Lord, you're an awesome God. I thank you, Jesus, God, that your burden is light. God, that your yoke is easy. Lord, that 
We're called to be infants. We're called to be fully and completely reliant on you and you alone. Lord Jesus, you are our teacher. You're our shepherd. You're our father. You're our provider. God, help us to look to you. God, and for our source of life. And for the people in this room this morning, Lord, those, these people who are your children, your sons and daughters, God, I just ask that you meet them, Lord, right in the midst of where they're at, uh, with all the hurts, all the pains, but also the anger too, Lord. Maybe the sin even, God, the rebellion. Meet them there, Lord. God, help them to see how good you are. God, that you are a provider and you love them and you've died for them. You desire to show them mercy and grace. You desire to gather them in like a, like a mother hen with her chicks. God, if only they were willing. So, Lord, just help them be willing today. Help them be willing that they would just be open and honest with you. Lord, I love you. I praise the name of Jesus, in the name of all names. Amen.